decides to drive over to Susie's house to see what the holdup is. Janelle and her boyfriend Mike go to Susie's house and when they pull up they see Susie and Stacy's car parked in the driveway and Cheryl's car pulled into the carport as they begin to walk up to the front door they notice there's glass on the porch they kind of look around and realize that the front porch light above the door was broken now Janelle was not wearing shoes and Mike was worried she would step on glass so he got a broom and kind of swept the glass out of the area and then he went and dumped the glass along the fence line so that no one would step on it they knock on the door but no one answers now Janelle is very close friends with these girls so she tries the front door and it's unlocked so her and Mike go in they walk in through the living room and the kitchen they're kind of calling out for Susie and Stacy but no one answers now the living room and the kitchen look normal there's no sign of a struggle nothing suspicious at all so Janelle is like well Let's go look in the backyard. Maybe they're back there. But they go in the backyard and there's nobody back there. She's kind of confused, but she's thinking maybe they had walked to a neighbor's house or something like that. So she decides to leave. And as they're about to leave, the phone rings. Janelle thinks, oh, this could be Stacy or Susie, so she answers the phone. The male on the other end of the line doesn't identify himself. He just starts talking explicitly to Janelle and swearing, and this phone call was in a very sexual nature. So Janelle hangs up. She doesn't really know what to think of the call, but she does remember that Susie had complained about prank calls in the past. So she this is just some stupid boy's prank calling. The phone rings again and she answers it a second. This time, she realizes it is the same caller, and she immediately hangs up the phone, and her and Mike decide to leave. On the other side of town, Stacy's mom is becoming a little worried that she hasn't heard from Stacy. She, Stacy is usually really good about letting her parents know her plans and where she'll be. The last time she had talked to Stacy, she had called to tell her she would be sleeping at Janelle's. So she decides to call Janelle's house to talk to Stacy. Janelle's little sister answers the phone and tells her that Susie and 
see if the girls are there. So she drives over to Cheryl and Susie's house and when she pulls up, she sees the three cars out front and she has this momentary flood of relief. She's like, oh good, they're here. But that quickly disappeared when she realized no one was at the home. She goes up to the front door and begins knocking on the door and while she is standing there waiting for someone to answer, Janelle and Mike pull up. They have come back to try to see if their friends have returned or what is going on. So the three of them enter the home. Again, there's nobody in there. Everything is in its place. And Janice, Stacy's mom, decides to go look in the bedrooms to see if they are in the bedrooms. So she walks into Susie's bedroom and she gets the sick feeling when she sees Stacy, Susie, and Cheryl's purses all lined up on the floor. Now it would be normal if Stacy and Susie's purses were in Susie's bedroom, but the fact that Cheryl's was in there as well felt very off to Janice. She looks around the room and she sees on the dresser are Stacy's clothes she had worn the night before and they're folded up in a nice little pile with her shoes on the bottom. These were the only clothes Stacy had when she left her home and she really begins to panic when she realizes her daughter wouldn't have gone anywhere without her shoes. Maybe she could have borrowed some of Susie's clothes, but seeing her shoes really set off alarm bells. She turns to her daughter's purse and begins to dig through it, and inside is her daughter's wallet, her driver's license, and her makeup bag. It would be really weird for Stacy to go to Whitewater without her purse, but it was unheard of for Stacy to leave anywhere without taking her makeup bag. So the mom at this point is fully panicking. She calls her husband and she's like, they are missing. They're gone. I've called everyone I can think to. No one has seen the girls. So he's like, I'll be right there. I'll meet you at Susie's house. Janice hangs up the phone with her husband and immediately calls police. Now, if this is every parent's worst nightmare, it has been over 12 hours since anyone has seen or heard from Susie and Stacy. The police arrive at the home and as they pull up, there are people kind of milling around the front yard. There are people inside of the home. People are just kind of coming and going. The home appeared to be normal. Nothing was suspicious. The officer who was the first dispatched to the scene walked around the home trying to note anything suspicious. But there were no signs of a struggle, no signs of forced entry at all. He goes into Susie's bedroom and he said it was apparent that the girls had been there that night. The clothes they had worn the night before were found in the bedroom. 
Ha <laughs> ha. 
recently this relationship has taken a very drastic turn for the worst. After many, many years of this tumultuous family relationship, Bart started to kind of keep his distance from the family. He moved out of state and didn't have much contact with his mother and sister. This was unfortunate, but it was okay for Cheryl. Of course, she loved her son, but he had such a violent temper. When he drank, it got much worse, and he had even hit his mother before. So, he's living out of the state and doesn't have much contact with his family. But then he breaks up with his girlfriend and he moves back to Springfield. He wants to reconnect with his mother and sister and try to build a better relationship with them. So he moves back to Springfield. He gets a job for a serving company and he's making pretty good money and slowly he kind of becomes more and more involved in their lives. Now Susie was ecstatic to have her brother back in her life. She loved him and she was very happy to have a relationship with him once again. Cheryl was a little more hesitant. She had seen the very darkest side of Bart and it worried her. Now Susie turned 18 her senior year of high school and she decided she wanted to move in with her brother and live with him. Now he lived only four miles from Cheryl's house, so Susie wasn't moving anywhere like too far, but Cheryl was still pretty concerned and she really hoped that Bart could just keep his temper and his drinking under control. One night, Bart had been drinking and was very inebriated, and he was playing his music super, super loud, and Susie went in and told him to turn the music down, and he wouldn't, so she kind of reached over him to turn the knob down, and this enraged Bart. He stood up and shoved his sister and they began to fight, and that was the last time Susie ever spoke to her brother again. Cheryl was worried that Bart would get drunk and come after her or her daughter, so she made the difficult decision to disinherit Bart, and she was adamant he was not to come to her house or to ever be around Cheryl or Susie. Cheryl's sister was laid 
police ask his neighbor and he says, yes, Bart was at my house till about 11.30 p.m. He drank quite a bit. In fact, he told police he was sloshed. Now there is nobody that can confirm Bart's story that he stayed home after leaving his neighbors and didn't leave the house again. So police ask him if he will take a polygraph test and the polygraph test is administered and Bart passes. The police officer said that the test showed Bart was being truthful, but he also acknowledged that Bart had a history of these violent temper outbreaks and Bart could have blacked out and doesn't remember what happened that night. So he thinks he's telling the truth. But they had no evidence to tie Bart to the disappearances at all. So they decide to just follow up on other leads. The more time that goes by, the less likely it is that these women will be found alive. So the police officers were under a lot of pressure. The search began to expand from just Cheryl's home to the entire area. Family, friends, volunteers who didn't even know the women came out to help search for anything they could find. Lake Springville was drug to see if there were any bodies in the lake. Helicopters were used, police dogs were used, cadaver dogs were brought in, but nothing was ever found. The families of these missing women were just distraught. Sidizi's mom said, quote, my heart just sunk. It was horrible. Cheryl's sister said she was a complete mess, but she kept having these dreams that she was in a car and Cheryl was riding in a car next to her, and she was trying to tell her sister she was okay. She'd be like, I'm okay. Everything's okay. It's okay. Cheryl's sister felt like Cheryl was trying to communicate with her. As the investigation continued, police find another suspicious person. They want to look into Susie's ex-boyfriend, Dustin Rackloff. Now, Dustin had worked at the same movie theater as Susie, so they had met there and dated. They had a really good relationship. They always got along really, really well until something happened that drastically ended the relationship. Now, remember, Susie was really into the bad boy types. Well, Dustin and his friend Michael were involved in a break-in in a mausoleum. The two teens had broken into this mausoleum and stolen teeth from the remains. They reportedly wanted to use the gold fillings to try to sell and get money. Police quickly realized that Susie's car had been used during the commission of these crimes, so they brought Susie in for questioning. Now, she was very cooperative and straight out told police Dustin and Michael were involved. They were the ones who had broken into the mausoleum. And police officers 
officers asked her if she would be willing to testify in court, and she agreed. This made her boyfriend and Michael furious. They felt like she should have lied for them. They really felt like she hung them out to dry. Now, Stacy was scheduled to testify in their court case, but it had not yet happened when she disappeared. So the police are thinking these two could have definitely wanted to seek some revenge on Susie, or maybe even just make her disappear so she would not be able to testify against them. So, police bring the two teenage boys in to question them. Now, Michael doesn't even try to hide his hatred for Susie. He tells the police officers, I hope they're dead. I wish they were dead. And the officer who was interrogating him said the hairs on the back of his neck stood up when he said that. Dustin told police that the night the girls had went missing, he had been drinking and passed out in his car, like blacked out because he was so drunk, and he never saw them, and he had nothing to do with their disappearance. Now, he also has no one that can confirm he was just passed out drunk in his car. So police ask both of the boys to take polygraphs, which they both pass. Now the only way they could possibly tie these boys to the crime is using evidence. And while they don't have much evidence, they do have fingerprints. So they take fingerprints from the two teenage boys and they're able to clear them using their fingerprints. Time goes by and this case begins to grow cold. Police just don't have anything to go on. They have no real evidence. They have no bodies. They have nothing. And then they get a call from a tipster telling them there is a killer in Springfield and it is likely he is involved in the Springfield three disappearances. The caller tells police they need to look at a man named Robert Cox. Robert Cox had been convicted of kidnapping and assault with a deadly weapon, but he was also the prime suspect in this unsolved murder from 1976 of a woman named Sharon Sellers. Sharon was a teenager who was abducted in Florida on her way home from Disney World, where she worked. Robert Cox had been in Florida staying at a hotel with his parents when she went missing. The night Sharon was abducted, Robert shows up back at the hotel with a severe injury to his tongue. His tongue 
Stacy's father. Now Stacy's father tells police that he didn't ever know Robert Cox when the two worked together. Cox was a used car salesman and he worked on a different part of the lot. He does say that it is possible that Cox could have seen Stacy because she often would show up at the car dealership with lunch or dinner for her father. Police bring in Robert Cox and he denies having anything to do with the disappearances. He tells police he had gone to a golf tournament um, the night the girls graduated and he had slept at his parents' house because he was closer to their house. And then early the next morning, he picked his girlfriend up and they attended church together. Police interview the girlfriend and she gives Cox the alibi he needed. She says yes, they went to church together. Now police have absolutely nothing tying Robert Cox to this case. And even Stacy's father thinks it's just a really big coincidence that the two worked at the same place together briefly. Three years later, in 1995, Robert Cox ends up on police's radar again. He was arrested in Texas for holding an armed weapon on a 12-year-old girl, and he was sentenced to life in prison for aggravated robbery. When Cox is found guilty of this crime, police began to think maybe he was involved in the disappearances, so they send investigators out to Texas to interview Robert Cox. Now this time, he won't talk to police. He doesn't deny being involved in the case, but he also doesn't admit to being involved. He just won't talk at all to police. So they track down his ex-girlfriend and re-interview her story has drastically changed from the first time police interviewed her. She said not only did she not attend church with Robert Cox, she wasn't even with him that entire day. Armed with this new information, police start to try to find anything that can tie Cox to the disappearances. Then a local TV station interviews Robert Cox in prison and they ask him about the Springfield Three. Robert says, quote, I know they are dead. I will say that. I know that. And the reporter is like, so this isn't just a theory that you think they're dead. And he says, quote, I just know they are dead. That's not my theory. I just know that. I have no doubt about that. This interview sends shockwaves through the Springfield community and police again head to Texas to try and interview Cox about the disappearance. He will not admit to the crime or being involved at all, but he does tell police officers he just knows they are dead, and when his mother dies, he will tell them everything he knows, but not before then. Now, there are so many cases where these crazy people admit to committing crimes that they didn't commit, so police don't know if Robert Cox killed the Springfield 
something or somebody saw something suspicious and I really hope this case will be solved so that the 